those statistics that I'm sharing don't mean that our people are fucking victims. And that's unfortunately a large narrative that's being portrayed in media currently. And so this is part of the pictures is that we're not victims. We've been resisting, we've been resilient, we've been fighting for many generations to maintain our ways of life. This is BeastCast number 11. The Navajo Nation has been hard hit by the COVID-19 virus, with over 1,600 known cases as of this weekend. An area about the size of West Virginia, they are facing the third highest rate of COVID-19 infections per capita in the country, behind New York and New Jersey. At the Talahogan Info Shop in Kinflane, so-called Flagstaff, Arizona, the community has organized a mutual aid hub. We talked to Klee Benali, a mutual aid organizer who educated us on solid analysis and praxis for community self-defense. We discussed the situation on the reservation, the impact of racist colonial violence and the challenges his people face, the weekend lockdown, and the mutual aid efforts conducted by the Talahogan Info Shop. While we did this interview, the free store at the info shop was open to assist unsheltered folks. So you'll hear some background noise. <laughs> Alright, and so we're also meeting with um, Klee from the Talagan Info Shop. If we could ask how it is that you got involved with the info shop. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders among about 16 folks. Back in 2007, we had a youth group called Youth of the Peaks which was a really powerful youth mobilization in response to the threats of desecration to the San Francisco peaks. So it was all indigenous youth, high school students who rose up very powerfully, very militantly. They were able to mobilize hundreds of youth to demonstrations, a lot of them wearing camo and just making demands. You know, they weren't seeking like this sort of like weird um, reforms. It was really just powerful. Um, and just asserted uh, a very strong cultural uh, you know, desire and position addressing the desecra threats of desecration. And so they were being really vilified in the media. Uh, they were called uh, anarchist militant gangsters, uh, an anarch anarchist militant gang. Like they were just in uh, two of the members of their group uh, two young high school students, they were both female, I think 15 at the time, were targeted at their high school by the gang task force here that used to wear uh, tactical attire. So they went into their school, pulled these two young um, women out of their classes and interrogated them without supervisors or parents and really just threatened them, um, tried to like interrogate them about their organizing and all that. And so when you look at the racial dyna dynamics here in this so-called border town of Flagstaff, this settler colony. Um, it's always been the settler, you know, voices and views that have been legitimized in the media and young, you know, native high school students, who's going to believe them or, you know, trust what they say. And so we started a media justice project called Out of Your Backpack Media from that. And we started doing workshops throughout the community at borrowed spaces, but we realized we needed to actually set a center. There had been two previous info shops in the past here in Kinflana or Flagstaff, and they both were like the typical sort of white, you know, punk, anarchist dominated spaces, which aren't always welcoming to folks of color. And so we sat down and talked with a crew of folks who were interested in starting an info shop and with the youth. Uh, from Youth of the Peaks, and we just were like, let's do it. But instead of like, because they were very well organized already, so instead of like, let's try to figure out how we're going to organize and build a space, what our visions and goals are, they were just like, let's get a space, then we'll organize. And it actually worked out really well. And so we've moved two places before, and now we're here and we actually own the building. Um, we're still paying off a big loan so if anybody wants to help us with that 
Um, but yeah, so I've been a troublemaker in the region for a long time. I've been involved in the resistance to the desecration of the Holy San Francisco Peaks. Um, and I've been helping to um, agitate and provoke uh, and intervene as effectively as possible. So this is one part of that. If I could go back, uh, you were talking about the two young women. What was community response? Was there support for them? Yeah, well, I mean, support from the indigenous community. I mean, they, we, they organized strongly with their parents and were able to force an apology and reforms from the gang task force, which was good, but, you know, it still didn't, you know, address the underlying structural issues. But it was a good assertion and it forced them to back off. So they know they, they weren't afraid, you know, they weren't, they didn't get scared into not organizing. <laughs> it gave them validation as to what they were doing. It was a powerful teaching opportunity. You said that you were working on what was happening to the San Francisco Peaks, and now uh, what was your organizing surrounding that? What was the desecration taking place? Well, so we've been fighting to protect our sacred lands here. The San Francisco Peaks, we call the Koosli, are one of six holy mountains for Diné people. They're culturally significant to all 22 indigenous nations throughout so-called Arizona. But they're also um, sacred or holy, they're central to the ways of life of 13 indigenous nations. And so for decades upon decades, we've been resisting attempts to uh, desecrate the mountain, whether it's through mining or whether it's through recreation. And so, of course, mo a lot of folks know about Arizona Snowball Ski Area. Since the 1960s, they've been trying to push development and expansion, and we've resisted. Um, not m my parents' generations resisted at that time. Um, and so the, ma the mountain is managed by the United States Forest Service's so-called public lands. And so they just sort of paved the way like many other government agencies for any profit exploitation on sacred lands. So it's really a matter of resource colonialism um, and recreation being the resource in this case. And so 2001, 2002, they proposed an expansion of their ski area facilities um, that were permitted only after a long battle to the Supreme Court that reaffirmed that as indigenous people, we don't have religious freedom when it comes down to public land use. Um, and that was a 1983 decision called Wilson versus Block. But they came back with this new proposal to expand and make snow out of treated sewage. So the plan was to um, get a contract to purchase uh, 180 million gallons of treated sewage from the city of Flagstaff to pump in a 14.8 mile pipeline up the mountain to a 10 million gallon storage pond where then they could feed that uh, to snowmaking machines to spray on 205 or so acres of the mountain. So basically it's a plan to spray the sewage from this colonial settlement uh, onto a mountain that's holy to 13 indigenous nations. So the fight has been um, very complex. You know, we've done everything from the administrative appeals process to litigation. Uh, there was attempts from, from indigenous nations to purchase the ski area. Um, and then of course, direct intervention in 2011 and 12, um, after the Supreme Court reaffirmed the lower court ruling, denying um, our fight to protect this mountain. Um, of course, we you know knew that the courts weren't necessarily gonna rule it for us because there is no justice on stolen land and the courts were never designed and their laws were never designed to benefit our people. And so we um, mobilized direct action responses through a group called Protect the Peaks. So initially I was involved with the organization called Save the Peaks Coalition that was sort of formulating the, um, the general organizing response. And then uh, it was escalated into a group called Protect the Peaks. So the peaks are also uh, sacred to you all. What else is part of your territory traditionally before the reservation? Yeah, I don't like the word territory. Like I think people have a sense of territorialism and it still has connotations to like private property. I think lands, sacred lands and land bases is a more appropriate term. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, we reside, uh, our ancestral homelands are within six sacred mountains. We have four primary cardinal mountains that represent the pillars that uphold our universe and our cosmology. And so they're located, um, the eastern, easternmost point is in Colorado, uh, southernmost point is in New Mexico, Mount Taylor. Um, then we have uh, the Coalesley here um, 
the San Francisco peaks than uh, Mount Hesperus or the Bennett Saw in the north in Colorado as well. But Cisna Genie is the easternmost one. I think it's uh, Alamosa over, over there. Mar Mount Blanca is the English name. So everything within that is our ancestral homelands. It's very large homeland compared to where you are now. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if you can contrast that to other indigenous nations who, especially in the East Coast, were forced, you know, hundreds of miles from their ancestral homelands uh, it's to, under very small reservations, you know, that's a, that's a different picture. I mean, our, our land base, reservation-wise, is the, the largest land base um, of any so-called federally recognized tribe here in, in the U.S. Um, it's roughly the size of West Virginia. Um, but West Virginia has a population of 1.8 million. We have a population of 100, about 180,000 that live on the res, but a total population of about 300,000 plus of enrolled members of our nation. Okay. So we were just curious, I was just curious about the uh, logistics of how with the Hopi Nation inside and the Navajo Nation going into lockdown, are you coordinating together? So the Navajo and Hopi Families Relief Fund and effort was initiated specifically as a point of solidarity um, to address the crisis of COVID-19 impacting okay, our communities. So and so it's it's a cross, you know, or international, <laughs> inter-indigenous uh, effort. The curfew that's been imposed by Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez um, doesn't have restrictions for folks, you know, in and out of the Hopi reservation. But you have to understand that the Hopi um, uh, villages, there, I think all 12 villages are in lockdown right now. Nobody's going in, nobody's going out, except for, you know, for critical needs. So uh, that's, and that's ongoing. And how are you able to ensure that people are not coming into uh, your reservation? Like so, so <laughs> I, I take issue with the way you're asking that question to me, because I'm not. Uh, you know, an in, in authority that's imposing that restriction. I don't necessarily support that restriction um, on certain levels. Um, but what the Navajo Nation is doing there, um, enforcement agents is in some areas setting up setting up checkpoints and policing, and then you know um, having patrols go around and issue things on intercom. But I mean, it's it's a it's a quasi police state, a temporary police state, especially on the weekends. You know, right now. Um, the Navajo Nation has shut, shut down um, uh, access to visit, so-called visitors or outsiders, non-tribal enrolled members or people who don't have family or, or work on, on the reservation lands. Um, uh, and then on the weekends, they impose a 57-hour curfew, which um, you know, has some, certain exemptions, I mean, for essential needs, uh, like if people need emergency plot supplies and things like that. You know they're able to do it, but yeah, there's heavy policing and reports. Like the the biggest concern is is that they're uh, enforcing fines and uh, potential imprisonment. So it's a thousand dollar fine if you break curfew, and this is all weekend long. It's not just at night, and uh, thirty day up to thirty days in jail as well. So that's the, the 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 threat, and I don't I don't agree with it. I think that you know of course it's I I believe it's author extraordinarily authoritarianism. It's indigenous authoritarianism. Um, that our people should be able to organize and understand um, uh, the need to stay home if we need or shelter in place and care for each other. And that should come from our own determination, not some government threatening us when we have 40% uh, unemployment rates on a reservation that has 33% um, of the households that don't have running water and electricity. And we also have a long history of environmental uh, racism in this, you know, declared national sacrifice zones with the plague of environmental devastation and ecocide from a range of industries from uranium mining to coal mining um, and poisoning of our waterways, um, you know, telling, telling people that they're going to face, you know, the, the threat of state violence and, and um, fines <laughs> who live in those conditions that are already deprived on some levels, then that's a serious issue. Um, but you know, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't, I don't argue with the need to stay home and maintain social distancing and just being smart about not exposing or ourselves or other people uh, to this deadly virus. But I take issue with the authoritarianism that, the, you know, the, 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 the boot on our neck that comes along with that, that forces us to do that.
Um, and so that's, you know, an underlying, you know, longer-term issue. I mean, the Navajo Nation never has really acted in um, the interest of our, our people um, to, on a structural level, because it was initially established in 19, the Tribal Council was initially established in 1923 for the explicit purpose of signing mineral and gas leases. So it's a resource colony by design. And so if you look at the history, if you look at um, the, the resource exploitation that exists in our communities, I mean, in the Four Corners area, there's a methane cloud the size of Delaware hanging over the San Juan Basin, and that's right over Shiprock um, in our communities that um, uh, have two massive coal-fired power plant operations. One is the San Juan power plant. The other one is the Four Corners power plant. The Four Corners power plant is the one of the most significant emitters of carbon uh, in the country for greenhouse gases and, and global warming. And so, you know, this is part of the picture that we face, which is that the Navajo Nation has made policy decisions regarding um, resource extraction that have led to uh, compromised immune systems. Uh, so they don't, you know, their, their interest for our well-being and care isn't necessarily at the forefront. You know, we've, we have over 523 abandoned uranium mines in our lands. The EPA has closed 22 wells. Not a single one of these abandoned uranium mines has cleaned up. On top of that, in 1979, we had the single largest nuclear accident in U.S. history with the church rock spill happened. That was never fully cleaned up. It's never been completely remediated. Um, there are still health impacts from, from that. We have uh, statistically high rates of cancer in our communities, but there's never been a comprehensive human health study um, to the Im impacts of these abandoned uranium mines and the legacy of um, nuclear colonialism. And so this is part of the underlying picture and the challenge and tensions that we face. So, um, yeah, I don't, that probably responds to more uh, than what your question is. But, uh, you know, the, the technical aspects of how they're enforcing a curfew or restrictions regarding who can come and who can go is one thing. Um, but the un overall picture of um, the lack of infrastructure and the challenges that our people face is, is part of that. Um, and it goes to be ignored. I will say one more thing regarding that is, is that, um, you know, those statistics that I'm sharing don't mean that our people are fucking victims. And that's unfortunately a large narrative that's being portrayed in media currently. Um, a lot of corporate media sort of like, you know, preyed on this, oh, well, yeah, certainly it's an extreme crisis because the Navajo Nation indigenous community um, that nobody really, you know, cares about unless there's some kind of catastrophe like the uh, Animus River spill back in 2015. Um, uh, we have the, uh, well, I mean, of, as of yesterday, we had 12, about 1,200 cases of confirmed uh, COVID-19, 44 deaths as of yesterday. It's, I'm sure it's um, escalated from then. But if you look at the statistics, or if you look at it based on per capita, um, we're just behind two other states uh, per capita for COVID-19 cases. It's insane. Um, and so this is part of the pictures is that we're not victims. We are actually, we've been resisting, we've been resilient, we've been fighting um, uh, for many generations to maintain our ways of life, especially the traditional people. Those statistics don't apply to them. They don't need running water. They don't need electricity because we live off the land. Um, and that's, you know, part of the reality. It's, it's not like, it's not, we're, we're not depraved from capitalism. We're actually still being attacked by capitalist expansion in our communities. And so, you know, the answer isn't to have Walmarts and fucking big box corporations on every corner. That wouldn't save us. That would just make us more dependent upon the corporate uh, infrastructure as part of um, the undermining of our ways of life, which is ultimately colonialism. Would you prefer to see the response for, for the help of your people during this crisis or just in, in general, if you would like to expand on that? We're doing it right now. So what projects do you have running? Well, so the Navajo and Hopi family relief effort that was started by Ethel Branch, uh, I think on March 15th, um, really just started as a GoFundMe page and sort of part of the model on Facebook was a Facebook group with some forms, like a lot of the other mutual emergency sort of like mutual aid response groups that have started throughout um, the so-called U.S. And so um, it's really just a great model that's an anarchist model of solidarity, not charity, that our people are helping ourselves. It's not some aid groups, you know, coming in, um, trying to save us, which has been the configuration of white allyship for generations um, and, and ultimately is a way to keep our people down. 
Um, but we are we are amassing the resources, um, and in this case, it's through crowdfunding and other other donations or direct support. Like we just got this. Oddly enough, we got a massive donation from Dr. Bonner's today that somebody arranged, you know, so like there's just all this interesting sort of like redistribution of material goods. Um, and, you know, it's it's in some ways it's it's very close to radical redistribution of wealth. Um, and these resources, you know, COVID-19 in many ways, it is a it is a public health crisis, but it's also a resource crisis. It's about who has access to resources and who doesn't. And that's a simple question of like the complexities and, and, and the failures of capitalism. Um, because the fact that we, you know, there are food, there's food sitting in warehouses, there's fucking empty houses sitting around where all our unsheltered <laughs> relatives are uh, being forced into crowded shelters uh, in unsafe environments. Um, you know, that's part of where we should be moving with radical redistribution. But uh, to respond more to your question, it's, the, 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 the bottom line is that's taking care of our, our thoughts on building that capacity to be able to maintain that and and build whatever infrastructure on a long-term basis that we need on our own terms um that aren't uh and, and this is my politic is is that that they, that means it shouldn't be um based on destruction of our mother earth which is indigenous people that's an extension of us so whatever we do to the land we do to ourselves and so that should be the first understanding um and there are many others that come from it but you know, as indigenous folks, this sort of call for mutual aid is really a call for us to engage in what we call F, which is our traditional familial relationships, our clan system. And so we've already ha always had, and I think, you know, Kropotkin even acknowledged this in um, his book, Mutual Aid, a Factor of uh, Evolution, is, is that, you know, he, he, he didn't, it, it's not a, a European concept that he just made, it was made off of his observations through the natural world, how animals um, work together to help each other in spite of this evolutionary theory of um, uh, uh, survival of the fittest and competition overall. Um, uh, but, you know, studying also indigenous communities. So, you know, this is, you know, the, the, the question of, and in, in, in the concept of mutual aid is actually a coming home for us and activating of our traditional cultural ways um, in spite of the failures of capitalism, uh, in spite of the failures of these um, government institutions. The Navajo Nation government, a week, or a month after um, Ethel Branch set up her GoFundMe effort, um, finally set up their own fund, you know, and is uh, restricting at this point every weekend during the curfew. Like we've had two weekends of curfews right now imposed on the Navajo Nation. Um, the first weekend, uh, there was a re we, we request, our organization requested an exemption um, to be able to provide relief, and it was denied. We um, uh, made that same request this, this weekend, and it was denied. And this is why I say it's indigenous authoritarianism, because, uh, I mean, there's international standards established to allow for humanitarian relief efforts. You know, people can fucking die, and that's what we're dealing with um, right now, is to ensure that our people have the needs, and those most vulnerable have their needs met, um, and they have access to the resources that they need uh, through this crisis, because not everybody's getting the information. Um, that there's a lockdown and they could be at risk of, you know, state violence through imposition of um, fines and or jail. And what kind of position does this put houseless folks into? Well, that's, I mean, I mean, this is what we're dealing with here and I'm sure you're dealing with in your community um, and something that we responded to immediately because we have, you know, here at Tullaho One, uh, we have a long history of providing mutual aid for unsheltered relatives. Um, and so we've done a lot of work in the past, you know, just basic distribution of resources, um, you know, just connecting with folks and restoring humanity and organizing with unsheltered uh, community members. And so as the crisis was escalating, uh, we just talked to a lot of the folks that we work with or we have relationship with or that are our relatives um, and uh, started building from there. But the impacts are extreme. I mean, I attended a webinar as this crisis was just coming to the so-called U.S. that was hosted by uh, Chief Seattle Club and a range of other um, professionals who address, uh, like institutionally and nonprofit uh, orgs, address um, uh, urban, homeless, indigenous populations. And so um, on that webinar, though, basically they were just saying, if you don't, you know, they were just sort of like putting on display their infrastructure. 
and their process, like their screening processes, their ability in their shelters to isolate, um, their ability to like distribute all the hygiene needs, and all that stuff. Um, and we don't have that here. We have like, we have three shelters. Um, one of them uh, is a men's only shelter that's crowded downtown. Another one is Hope Cottage, which is a crisis uh, shelter for women and uh, children. Um, and then another shelter, which is Flagstaff Shelter Services, which is considered the main, the primary shelter here. They have about 170 beds. Uh, they just did an expansion with the bottom level and the top level for, for their capacity. But initially, in the first wave of COVID-19 cases throughout um, the so-called U.S. here, what we saw was is that they had no fucking plan. They completely failed to consider the needs of unsheltered folks. I mean, the, 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 the mayor, Coral Evans, here in the city of Flagstaff, issued an, an emergency, very proactive, uh, partial shutdown of all the businesses, uh, except for essential ones. And what that ha what the effect was, though, is, is that all of those businesses that unsheltered folks go to to maintain their hygiene and to use the bathroom were not accessible to them. Um, the buses were opened up for free, but then what happened is, is that they have um, a specific order for the drivers that riders need to have a, uh, a valid destination. But that's a gray area, you know. The, it's up to the drivers to determine what's valid or not. So, people, you know, we're seeing discrimination, people being denied, um, you know. And uh, of course, there's some people who are joyriding or whatever, touring, as they call it. So, travel is is a challenge. But yeah, I mean, the the biggest issue that we see is is that one that if people are being told to shelter in place, people or stay at home if they're sick, or and maintain their hygiene and wash their hands um, uh, constantly. Um, those are none of those three things are things that unsheltered people can do, um, and so especially when you have a, a shelter that is crowded that isn't practicing um, good health protocols, uh, then that puts people at risk. It's a, it's a time bomb in those kinds of spaces, and so um, unsheltered folks are extraordinarily vulnerable. Especially if we look at the age ranges, and here in Confluent or so-called Flagstaff, um, there's anywhere from 60 to 70 uh, percent of unsheltered folks um, that we that we work with we actually work with primarily unsheltered indigenous folks um, but anywhere at the shelter it's like 40 to 50 percent are uh, indigenous i don't know if there is an actual geographical sort of like analysis for this population but i would say it's close to 60 or 70 percent is indigenous or on the streets but yeah it, it's extremely challenging um, I, I, I mean, you can ask them. I, I don't want to speak to them, but I can, I can ex speak to the experiences that have been shared with me and the work that we've done over the years. And that's something that we've tried to ensure that we weren't, uh, that we were ahead of in our organizing as well. So I saw that you had shared information about hand washing stations that you had built. Was that before this or was it inspired no, by No, no, it, it was, it was in response to the COVID-19 crisis. We were looking like on the, um, the webinar call and with some of the research that I was doing, uh, we saw that other communities were providing or cities, municipalities were providing hand washing stations as just a basic way for people to maintain hygiene, especially because hand sanitizers, which, you know, we could very easily distribute before all of this, um, were very uh, scarce. And so um, we just looked at creative solutions to build, you know, things that could be accessible because um, one of the recommendations on the webinar was to, um, it, was, it was just a hard remark to accept, but the, one of the people on the webinar was saying, well, you can just go, go to like, you know, some rental company and get all their hand washing stations, but you got to do it quick because they're going to go fast. And I was like, how is that your response? Especially, you know, if you look at how big your environment is, this was in Seattle, <laughs> and the availability of hand washing stations to rent and obviously the costs and, and maintenance. And so, you know, we just, um, we looked at the fact that the city had no plan um, and it was failing unsheltered folks. At the same time, the, the, um, the, the mayor also rightly had released about 50 folks they were holding in jail for misdemeanors, um, but they had no plan. A lot of those folks were unsheltered folks. They went right onto the street and they overflowed the capacity at the shelters and other places as well. And so we just um, decided to look at different models that were online for like these camping sinks or river, gu river uh, guide use sinks um, for river tours. And um, we tried to make a design that was easily replicable, 
that could work in high-use environments and that was um, uh, as cheaply or freely accessible um, for materials as possible. And so we came up with this model and we put a zine together and shared that. And it's, it's actually spread all over the place, which is great. And, and it's spread internationally. There's communities and we're actually um, distributing uh, this week. We're taking up um, several uh, of the hand washing stations to some of the reservation communities that don't have running water um, so they can use them, them in their communities as well. And so um, it's, uh, it's spreading and being used um, not just for unsheltered folks, which is awesome. So what is the name of your mutual aid website and, fun and fundraiser? Um, so there's two sites. Uh, one is the Navajo Hopi Families Relief Fund and Effort, uh, which is www.navajohopisolidarity.org. And the other one is for Confunding Mutual Aid, which is the group based out of Kalaho One Info Shop. Um, and uh, we're, we're, we're sort of like structured as a, you know, overall, like very similar to other mutual aid responses throughout the so-called U.S., uh, but we're also hyper-focused on uh, ensuring that the well-being of our unsheltered relatives is um, looked after as well and advocated for. And so the website for that is www.kinflane, um, K-I-N-L-A-N-I, mutualaid.org. Uh, but you can also go to flagstaffmutualaid.org okay. and it redirects over there as well. Um, yeah, well, so I just wanted to respond um, in relation to like the overall formations with like mutual aid efforts and also just talk a little bit about what our sort of forward thinking is. Um, so we're establishing a directory right now. We're calling for um, different groups that are indigenous led uh, mutual aid efforts or community support efforts, even if they're not using the term mutual aid, um, to uh, be part of a directory. So we'll be setting up a website uh, specifically for indigenous mutual aid, um, primarily in, in sort of asserting an indigenous um, mutual aid, primarily because the needs um, of our communities are different than other communities. The geographies of our communities are different than many other communities as well. And um, I think the underlying you know, politics of unsettling and addressing colonialism um, is different as well. So a lot of folks are uh, addressing the failures of capitalism, but we also have to look at, you know, resource colonialism as a factor, as I mentioned, with our, you know, weakened immune systems, uh, but and also like the, 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 the fact that the Navajo Nation is a, a, in the Hopi areas are a food desert, um, which basically is a fancy word for saying that we um, only have about 16 grocery stores serving the entire populations that I talked about earlier. Um, and 13 of those are actually grocery stores. Three of them are just small community markets that have food as well. Um, uh, you know, isn't that, again, we need more grocery stores in every corner. It's that our um, food sovereignty has been attacked. Our ability to, you know, maintain traditional self-sufficient ways of life or culturally based um, self-sufficient ways of life has been under attack. Um, for many generations. And so a lot of folks do have to come and rely on these so-called border towns to go shopping at these big box fucking corporate stores. And so um, we need to forward think and look at ways to restore traditional cultural knowledges uh, and systems. And um, this is a great uh, and powerful opportunity. It's a painful opportunity, um, but to recognize that we need to return to those ways or reconnect to those ways more than return um, and move forward with them as well. And uh, there's a lot of other other components, but you know, one of the things that I'm concerned with, and maybe this is for a different show that y'all are doing, is just the, 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 it's just like sort of like the Occupy movement or to some, to some degree, which is very impossible to do, um, the, the, the anti-fascist movement. It's just like, you know, who would have thought in the, in the past, you know, several years, we would have had two massive, like, you know, sort of formations like that have widespread, you know, attention um, from the greater publics. And, um, you know, the, what we're seeing now, obviously, is a trend of co-optation of mutual aid efforts, um, which is really concerning. And the, the cool thing about those is you can't really co-opt mutual aid. It's just a, a you know, at, at, at its core, it's just about people taking care of each other, not relying on, you know, any other outside systems, which we should be doing anyways. It's, it's, it's part of nature and our ways of life. 
um, and it's a, a concept much older um, than uh, any sort of, whether it's anarchist politics or other politics um, as well. And I think that, you know, like ensuring that we assert that and we look at ways that mutual aid can also be mutual defense. Um, and we look at ensuring that our spaces um, are asserting themselves as radically intersectional as possible. Um, and that we're digging in deeper um, into challenging notions of charity, especially in um, the face of white supremacy and colonialism. You know, like if you have a, a, a mutual aid effort that becomes institutionalized through nonprofits after this, then we failed because they're just organizing to maintain capitalist infrastructure. Um, you know, the idea is, is that mutual aid networks not shouldn't be institutionalized. They should be decentralized and accessible to everybody. And that's how we should be configuring our lives, not in, into centralizing it into some fucking institution and, you know, that or, or ones that are co-opted even potentially by the state. I mean, the Democratic Party is right now, you know, has what looks like uh, from the outside a strategy of co-opting mutual aid efforts. Um, and so I think we need to be uh, highly uh, conscious of that and intervene and disrupt that as much as possible and radicalize it. I mean, because mutual aid is a radical concept. It's a basic concept. It's a fucking reasonable concept. But when you contrast it to colonial, colonialism and capitalism, white supremacy and heteropatriarchy, it's a radical concept. And that's where the tension needs to continue. Um, and there is a bit of a fight, I think, to be had. Um, but yeah, I think we also need to be forward looking at the potential stages of escalation in relation to scarcity of resources um, and ensuring that people don't feel like they have to fight each other um, uh, or continue to then like think that we have to, you know, just wait it out to, or, to, to, to return to a normal state of being because there was no fucking normal before this for many of our people. And we don't want this state to renormalize because what that means is the recuperation of capitalism and all the disparity that comes with that and violence and the recuperation of colonialism. So this is a very critical time when this system is weak um, and it's a very opportune time when we have just the unprecedented amount of mutual aid efforts spread throughout the whole world um, and, and they're networked right now, which is extraordinarily powerful, or they're building networks right now, which is an extraordinarily powerful opportunity. Um, so I, I hope that people dig deep um, and look at ways to build more meaningfully in their communities and sustain these efforts. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here, um, and hopefully other folks can do that as well. To donate, go to infanamutualaid.org. That's K I N L A N I mutualaid.org. Or go to flagstaffmutualaid.org, which will redirect you. And for more information, you can visit indigenousaction.org. For more anti authoritarian news by, about, and for people of color, check out our website, bellyofthebeastmedia.org. This interview was conducted by The Cat Lady and was edited by me, V, who is now signing off and reminding everyone out there, don't hate the media, be the media. Peace.